All right, so uh, we're in phase two of the day-long uh, meeting. I'm going to call, is this okay to call this the Brumfield Chronicles or whatever? This is the Requiem. <laughs> and part two, part one, we dealt with the history, your history and racquetball. And part two, I want to get to the nitty gritty. Hopefully this will be something that coaches can look at, players, athletes, and get something from this where you and I uh, swap our theories and techniques. Um, I wanted to start, I, I have for you my uh, DVD and my camp CD to help you with your game. Thank you. Because uh, yesterday you only, well, you only got like 42 points in two games and <laughs> you could probably score more. <laughs> Coach, I'm looking forward to reviewing these. <laughs> so, when you go back, we've had we've had some discussions about the game today versus the game then. But what I want to talk about are the things that haven't changed. Um, we talked about a little bit about the uh, thing that went around uh, from Steve Keeley uh, about from Bill Schultz, who wrote it to his mm -hmm. son in 1978 and a handwritten paper, those things are still true today about, mm. about shot making, taking your time on the serve, for example, uh, and those things. So in your mind, what has not changed? Well, you're still in a 20 by 40 hardwood court with a roof the same height. You're still in hitting with a racket that is strung and where the racket head is the only contact with the ball. You're still facing another human being who has strengths and weaknesses that are meant to be exploited in the competition. The rules are essentially the same, uh, with the exception of some nuances regarding the avoidable or intentional hinder rules. There's a lot that's the same. The ball is not substantially different the combination of the racket and the ball creates the difference. Right, and one of the things that gets talked about a lot, uh, I go back, we mentioned, again, I, I'm gonna speak for Steve Keeley's sure. email about docs versus jocks. That's one of his things. But I think mm. that something's being missed, and you touched on it earlier mm -hmm. today. True, the rackets are bigger, true, the ball and, and the uh, technology is different. The athletes are training differently. But something else that I have not heard people talk about, you touched on it. The players today started when they were two to four years old, the best ones. They didn't start in the era that, I mean, I played football and baseball, and then I learned racquetball. Correct. Play, most of the people in the era of the seven, oh, it's about all of them. In fact, the one person who stands out was the kid, Marty Hogan, who started as a young kid and then evolved into a professional athlete. So don't you think that counts for something? There's no doubt about that. It, it is a whole different world if you learn something as a three-year-old and continue it than if you try to take a game up when you're 15. Right. It's true with a language. It's true with the musical instrument. It's true with the racket. And I don't know if you can take an adult and teach them what Marty Hogan or Kane can do. Yeah, I... I and it's <laughs> not be because they don't intellectually understand it. It's very hard to take an adult and make him truly fluent in a language. He might be able to communicate but he never thinks in the language. Right. These champions today think in the language of racket, control, and power in a way that I can't, and no one short of Hogan could in right. the pioneer era for that reason. Now, so getting, getting to that point where, the, okay, the kids, they're growing up and they're learning racquetball. So that makes it a little different. Mm -hmm. I went to junior nationals uh, a few weeks ago. I'm watching kids 10 and under cut off lob serves, uh, hit backhand lob. My seven-year-olds are hitting backhand lob Z serves 
which at a little junior kid getting a lob Z serve up here, that's that's pretty hard to return. So given the fact that that is different, uh, even if you took a slow racket and a slow ball, I don't know as if the game would be as you envision it or as if some of the pioneers think long for the good old days. Remember the story of George Rudich we talked about earlier that could hit the ball hard. He hit the ball plenty hard and when it was dead. I saw it with my own eyes. You can, so. I I'm, felt it on my own leg. <laughs> well, I'm not sure that just, it's as simple as just changing the ball and the size of the racket. I don't think it is either because we don't ever want to diminish the evolution of the player and the skills of the player, but we never want to forget how that was built. It's very similar to what when Roger Bannister was the great long distance runner and right. nobody could break four minutes and it was right. thought that you would die if right. you tried to reach that right. limit. And then he, in 54, when he broke the four minute right. mile, everyone and his mother could run a four minute mile in the next year. It's because they've seen it, they felt it, and they know it's real. And what the human can do is when they expect to be able to do something, their body, mind, and spirit finds a way to do it. So Kane is a product of what Surratt and Hogan did with their backhands. The current players of that time could never have converted. I could never have watched Marty Hogan at eight years old hit his backhand and started to work on it and never make it a producing weapon. It would, it would improve, is my technique improved, my ability to create power, but there's a lot more that goes into feeling and imagining a shot in a competitive situation than drilling. So I might get to the point where I could drill and hit a Marty Hogan style backhand, but it's unlikely that I could ever fluently speak the language. It's interesting you mentioned Roger Bannister because when I look at Kane, I look at Kane as the Roger Bannister of racquetball because uh, nobody else in the history of the game was hitting between their legs behind their back, and he brought that to the game. Today, they all do. But 10 years ago, when, when I first started working with them, the crowd would go, <gasps> you'd hear this sound. People would suck in the air and not know what to do because they couldn't believe what they saw. But he what was. Kane has done that makes the gist of your statement correct is every element that can separate him from the opposition has been mined. And you've got a perfect predator, attacker, and defender with every single criteria he needs. That's the freak. That's the one that right. now everyone will build their game upon or they won't survive. It's almost as if you had a hybrid. You took the desire of a Charlie Brumfield with the athleticism of a Marty Hogan, the determination of a Cliff Swain, um, the growing up racquetball thing of a Sudzy Monchek, you combine it into one person. So stipulated, and I agree with your conclusion. Yeah, and that, that and that's what you have. I, um, when when people are coming up, and you know the what a great player, what a great player. One of the things that a uh, uh, a fellow, and I'll give him a prop here, Keith Miner. He's a good seniors player and used to race motocross. And he asked me the most <laughs> pertinent question. Everybody wants to know how does he train, what does he do? But no one asked me this question. How does he do it mentally? What does he do mentally? And to me, that that is the thing that separates the greatest and we touched on it earlier. Earlier today, you mentioned um, the will to win. The You mentioned your own experience when you came back from injury two months later to win the Nationals and everything. There is a, when you're competing one-on-one, -on -one, Pancho uh, Segura used to say, uh, when you get a whole bunch of people competing, one will always rise to the top and dominate. Well, what, what I see, so Kane has not always been an unapproachable god of playing. 
I think he always did all of the requisite things that have, like we call him, a composite or amalgam of everything else that right. everyone else has done well. What he's learned to do in the last five or six years is he's learned how to play all of these weapons in a symphony that makes him not capable of being beaten unless he beats himself. And I don't think that's going to happen. That's, one, that's another one of the things that he is, with good coaching, he's been able to accomplish is he knows how to use all his weapons. He is, his ego does not interfere with him utilizing those weapons in an effective and conscientious way. Because many great players will never reach their potential because their ego prevents them from doing so. They're going to hit this shot regardless of his effectiveness. He doesn't do that. That's true. He will do, he will change if he has to change. He'll stay with what he has to stay with or wants to stay with. And he's got every weapon on defense if the other player gets hot. What right. more can you be? Right. Uh, okay, so take you back to when you were number one. What would a day of practice be like for you? How did you practice? How did you prepare? It changed during my career. In the early portions of my career, I always, every day, hit a thousand shots by myself. Solo practice. In the nine, I mentioned that I had nine, I guess you wouldn't call it quadrants, but well, segments. Well, I was going to point that out. Nine quadrants You were being an English teacher. I, I let that one go by. Thank I thought, you very much. man, that was perfect. Nine quadrants. The, uh, what I did was I, I had my system of practice. And what it was, it was not so much to perfect the shot. Can I ask you what the system was? Yes, I would go to the, to the quadrant, the space. Well, okay, so what, what are the spaces? What I did, that, well, there's a, one in the front court, one in the front court middle, one in the front court side. So three in the three front. Three in the middle. Now, both those are in front of the uh, short or service line. Correct, and then the middle of the court with three and the back of the, the court with Receiving line three. to the service zone would be your middle. Correct, right? approximately and then, six and a half feet So you deep. got three in each area, so you got nine. And what I wanted to be able to do was to hit a shot from each one of those points into alternate coverage patterns. So I graphed out the court and said, if I wanted to stretch my opponent from this point by striking only two types of shots. Can I stop shots, you right here? Sure. This is important if you want to get better in racquetball. Go ahead. I needed to have a shot that would freeze my opponent so that he would to actually get him off of me. To do that, you have to have a shot that goes to the farthest reach of the court and one that goes to the closest so that he has to cover the hypotenuse distance of the court, which is the longest distance you can make him move. So my goal was to be able to execute a minimum of those two shots from each block. And without those, you have to execute. By that I mean your shot has to be super accurate and powerful to win. I didn't want to have to do that. I wanted to be able to hit a pretty good shot with pretty good pace and win. So I set up the alternate coverage pattern. So let's say, for example, I was hitting from the right middle quadrant. Okay. I would want to have a shot that ended up in the front right and one that ended up in the back left. And what I would That would translate to a down-the-line kill and a cross-court pass? It would translate into a down-the-line sliding kill at half speed and a wide-angle pass around sliding the player. Sliding kill means it's a down-the-line? Correct. But it's I'm not hitting it so that it goes beyond me. Right. So in the... One of the one of the instructors calls this pass kill. I hate the term pass kill, but I use it's either a kill or a pass. But a pass kill lands twice on the floor before the receiving line. Is that what you're talking about? It was, but I what I built my game around was never having to do what the moderns refer to as kill the ball. Right. We used to keep stats. 
when I was playing Surratt, for instance, uh -huh. and he was a magnificent shooter of the ball. His ball rolled. And at the end of the stat page, he would get beat, let's say, 21-10, 21-8. He would have the approximate same number of kills as I did, but I would have no errors, and he would have the same number of errors as he had kills. The reason for that is, as good a striker of the ball as he was, if you ask someone to hit it a quarter inch above the floor, there's going to be an error factor because there's a dispersion among the right. greatest players. I refuse to accept that fate under the grounds that the floor was my enemy. So I chose to hit the ball only when I had what you and I have discussed in the past as confluences. I needed to have circumstances that would allow me to hit the ball six inches high and win with them, and that was my kill. You have to work hard to get that. Right. And especially as the game has progressed, you have to be very careful because the other player has so much more offensive firepower now with the equipment, the evolution of players, and, and whatever. But during the pioneer days, if I could get the player off of me, that was a confluence. If he was stationed to where he could cover either the wide angle pass or the sliding kill down the line, it put him five feet behind me and to the left. That meant when I hit the ball and I'm standing right in the way, what are the chances of anyone covering the ball down the right? that's six inches high. That would be zero, zip zero and nada. If I wrapped it around him, what's the chances of him cutting it off? That again is zero. So the percentages for Charlie winning that point are 100%, and that's what happened. But as the game has progressed. Okay, let's talk about that. I agree that the more proficient the player is, and the easier it is to kill the ball from different points in the court will affect how soon I have to take a chance. But the concept of creating the, getting the player off of you, having the ball wrap around them and not come off the back wall, and slide the other with you in the way, and also, when I strike the wide angle, I wait until the ball is on the other side of the moon. I'm the moon. So the player can't see me hit the ball. As I hit the ball, I move forward as I hit it, and he loses the ball for an extra two feet. So I have created three so advantages. So I want to make sure that the people watching this totally understand that. You're taking the shot here. I, let's say I'm playing you. I'm over there, so I can't see the ball from here. Now as you move forward, you can't see I it still there. can't see it. And then if I'm driving the ball wide angle, it'll come out of my armpit. Right. And he'll be like this, and the ball's by. Right. No chance of cutting it off. The only obstacle is whether I can keep the ball off the back right. wall. There's no way... So that could translate to today's game. It should if you can keep it off the back wall. The right. problem with the current situation is I always passed it so that if I miscued on my pass or I hit the wrong angle uh -huh. so that he could get his racket on it over here, that it was here when it went by. It wasn't here when it went by. With the modern ball and racket, if you hit the ball this high on a wide angle pass, it, it, it is, read my lips, coming out the back wall. Right. So you have less ability to use that system unless you modify the pass shot. Probably the best way to do it is to just hit it at the guy now because it's so fast. If you can jam him with the ball to keep him off of you, I would try that too. But the question of, now, if you hit it downward, if you take that ball, you've got him on the back, and you drive it down uh, into the crack about a, a foot behind where the guy is stationed off of you, you might be able to keep it off the back wall. This is the same. 
this ball can be just flipped down the line six inches high and it's going to go for a winner every time if you get the guy off of you. So you have to sell the play to get him off of you. Okay, so without – let's look at it this way, though. Today's game, uh, or today's or the modern game of racquetball, what if – you mentioned driving the ball across court. What if your technique got so good, for example, your forearm stays above your elbow throughout the stroke, which puts the ball down. So if you, if you drill your technique enough and you work on your technique, much the way the tennis players are doing today, why can't you be what you used to call uh, low percentage shots? The percentage goes up. For example, I noticed in racquetball that all the coaches are teaching pretty much the tech, not the techniques, but the methodology that you're talking about. Don't make mistakes. Don't make mistakes. Don't make mistakes. But then I watch, <laughs> then I watch from, from the last 10 years, this guy who doesn't think like that. And then I think back of all the great champions that didn't think like that. They won the last 20, they won, you can win 80% of your matches not making mistakes. The last 20%, you have to execute the shot when you have the opportunity. Right. And if you're making your living by rallying, when it comes time to shoot, I see it watching, you know. And I, from my own personal experience, I played, when I played open, I played a guy that played up close to the front wall and I developed a passing game. So everybody started just hanging back and making me shoot. And when I had to shoot, I never could shoot as well as some of the guys that beat me. And I, I could control center court and still get beat by somebody shooting. All right, I'll respond to that. Firstly, if you're good enough to hit the first ball you get and hit it in 95% of the time, you don't need to think too much about shot selection. True. We know that. So the Canes and the Hogans of the world have got so many gifts that they don't need to think about a shot selection in order to win most of their matches. But if your goal is, let's say that you're returning serve uh, with your backhand from the back wall and you hit 70% of the balls for winners. But let's think the, the other guy can do the same thing. And you're trying to get a little bit of an edge. If you're trying to get a little bit of a percentage, which I think if you take the game of racquetball and you try to add a percentage point here, a percentage point here, a percentage point on how you're moving, a percentage point on how you're watching behind you, everything that you can gain, pretty soon you've become, you've moved from an A player to a double A or any other criteria you right. want to talk about. That's what we're talking about. Right. We're talking about learning the secrets that move you up a grade without being able to hit the ball better. Right. Right. And you never play poorly. You can be beaten, but if you go to the people that day in and day out, year in and year out can win, and they're not Kane or Marty, they have to learn aspects of this. Right. And when I teach, what I do is, especially when I teach beginners, which I do most of the time, I try to create a module circumstance where they can hit one area of the court to alternate coverage patterns. Just one. Start with one. And you know what they do until they get a ball there? They run their ass off. They try their hardest. They bum fight the opponent as best they can. But when it comes into that area, they've got some weapons to use. That's what does not happen with coaching techniques that talk about improving your swing. True. You end up not knowing what to do with the gun that's right. in your hand. Right. Okay. I, my thinking has always been learn how to score. Go stand on the driving range. Right. Get out on the court and the course and see how you score the ball. It's interesting you, you use that analogy. I got an email the other day uh, from the Wall Street Journal about that very thing, about golfers 
on the driving range and it doesn't translate at it all. It doesn't because it's, it's all the mental imagery which in the modern game has to happen in a split second. You have to know what instrument needs to play in the symphony and why right now. Right. You don't learn that by drop and hit 5,000 shots. You, that's a component part that you need to do at some point. But the, what, I, what I learned when I was a kid was how to score. And when I learned to score here, you know what I did? I wasn't happy with that, running around with my head cut off, way, hoping to get a spot while the other guy just moves me around the court. So I go, where's the next spot where he's getting the ball by me and I'm having to do the running? I want a module there, too. All right, so, so that the public understands exactly what you're saying. One area would be, let's take your uh, six area back, which would be in the mid-court right side. In the modern game, I wouldn't even be considering it that way. I would say two things right off the bat. I would work on developing 20 serves. 20 serves. 20 serves. I'd have a service book like a pitcher would. Right. I would, I would put tape on the flo floor and the wall until I could make that ball go right over that line right. at 150 miles an hour right. and could fake to either side right. and could serve 20 different separate serves. Right. I would work on that and the rest of the, the session would be on drop and hit, hitting the ball as hard as I could from both sides with no effort to control the technique. Just getting used to calling on your body, mind, and spirit to hit the ball as hard as you can. If you go on the internet and look at some of the squash instruction by the cons, one of them says the first thing you do in conditioning is learn to hit the ball hard for an hour. Until you can do that, you can forget the rest. So if you go out there and you hit the ball as hard as you can, even if you start with 20, like you and I talked about doing yesterday, All right. and you work on those 20 serves with a bucket of balls, you've, you've now got a module where you're probably serving as good as most double A players after you've done this exercise for a few months. Right. Then what's the next shot that happens in the game? Every rally I have ever seen with amateurs in racquetball in the last five years, the balls come off the back wall three times in each rally. Right. So what does that tell you? you need to be able to take your forehand off the back wall and score the ball or pass it so it doesn't hit the back wall again. Right. So that would be my next module. Right. I wouldn't tamper with my backhand off the back wall. I'd work on my forehand because, let's face it, the ball's coming right down the middle half the time. It's a plum if you've worked it a thousand shots a day. You get those two modules, you're pretty damn close to an open player to start out with, and you can't do anything. Right. Then, where's the next, here's the question you ask. Where in my typical rallies, with the level of competition I'm playing, am I getting the most balls that should be able to be scored by a decent player? Now, with me, people wanted to drive the ball to my backhand. They didn't want to leave the ball up front because I was too quick and I scored it. It didn't require Kane's swing or Hogan's swing or Swain's swing. I didn't care whether I hit like they did. I wanted to score the point. No one asked me, well, did you have a perfect swing while you scored that point? No. They didn't, they didn't hold the gymnastics 10.8? No. And the deal is this. My game was built around hitting the shot at the exact right time before the other person recovered to be a factor. Right. I did not set up to wait for him to become a defender. Right. I did not take the time to perfect a swinging motion that, that would lead that me. That translates to cutting as many shots as you can. I cut them all off, and the reason why I started that way is because I started in handball. And in handball on those small outdoor courts, there was no back wall. You weren't waiting for it. If, Whatever if, height it was when it went by. You had to three blocks. If no, you, you had to hit it then. And so I got used to hitting it then. And I found out that when I hit it then and my body was in the way 
and I was strong and willing to use my, my heavy bass and big ass that I gained another confluence. Right. So I took the ball now, and you're over here. You're not covering it. I don't right. care who you are. You could be Rich Wagner. You could be Kane. If I have the ball here and my body's here, you're not covering it. You may get a hinder. That's all you're getting. So I learned to do that. Now, once I, with me, when they drove the ball Today, to my, it might be avoidable hinder. I'll take my <laughs> chances on it. That's another thing we'll discuss later on. But when the backhand ball is driven to me, I had to be able to attack it before the other side right. could be in play because I didn't have All right. the backhand like Marty or Kane. So that translates, going right along with that, return to serve, you're trying to cut the ball off in the alley as many times as you can before it gets behind you. Even Let me explain direction. this to you. This is very important. The teaching methods used today by you and all the other great coaches are designed to have the player be able to hit with maximum power and then to make an immediate move to the front court to cover. I wouldn't agree with that totally. Okay, well then go ahead and tell me what's wrong with it. Well, well, first of all, return to serve off a of drive serve. Let's talk drive serve. Yes. Return to serve off drive serve, I see many players taking like a full swing and you don't have to do that it's the powers being provided for you all you have to do is block it and then the instead of and I see many people coming to the all right let me let me summarize there's several ways of thinking about striking the ball from backcourt right most of the current teachers talk in terms of using a swing that gives you the, the most power and accuracy so that you can either throw the server off balance or you can hit a kill shot. Now, my thinking was different. My only concern when I was returning serve is that Charlie got in to the play to, with my body, disrupt the options of my opponent. And so what I did was I ran in and swung at the ball as a minor adjunct to getting in with my body. In and meaning in center court. In center court so that Which I Which was can, where geographically? About five feet farther forward than the current pros play. Really? It was much closer. So maybe not five feet, maybe three feet. So what I did was I sacrificed, supposedly, power and accuracy to accommodate my desire to be in the middle of the bum fight, to have a physical presence right there when this guy next struck the ball, if there was a next strike. Right. And what I found out was if I used that system where I was running and hit, not hitting so I could run, that my accuracy and power were better than if I stood and hit. I got the ball quicker from closer, and I was able to throw my opponent off balance much more than if had I set as the traditional teaching is, and swung and then moved. Even worse are what, what poor players do. They swing while falling backward and can't move in so that the play proceeds like the Polish touchdown. There's no one else on the field. And so they just the other guy just has to hit the front wall. Now that's, conversely, that's what I try to do to my opponent. I try to serve the ball in a way that their far first motion has to be back. That's all I care about, is that their weight is moving away from the play. Now, at that point, I am reading, a predator has an instinct. You need to be able to read what that person can do once you see him do this. It ain't much. So what I do then is I move into a new court coverage not the, f the 20 by 40 foot court, the eight foot court that this guy can possibly hit to. And I look like a superstar. 
because I'm on top of that next ball. With my pathetic backhand, I then hit a winner. You know what the winner is? A foot high plum away from a guy who's just crashed into the back wall because I've taken it when the getting was good. Now, I'd like response to that. Well, well, as I run through this in my mind, I'm trying to think of when I've ever seen anybody move back today off a drive serve. Uh, I don't see backward movement at all. You know all. why you don't? Why? Because nobody is using deception on their serves. They're using accuracy and power primarily. I watch him, and I even came, and I watched him dismantle a gentleman in the last tournament up in, at the Ectalon Nationals. There's, remember the balls that I aced you with yesterday? No. Where I, yeah, you do. <laughs> and I went like this, and I flipped the ball, and it went yeah, down oh, the yeah, right yeah, side, yeah. and you were doing this. You, you've seen Halasher play. You've seen Bruce yeah. Christensen play. Right. That art, if it exists, I haven't seen it in five well, years. Well, I think you're missing something. Tell me. Uh, the, I, I can't get up and move, can I? I have to talk to my technician. May I get up and move? No, I can't move. We can't do that, but we have to set up. Okay, all right. You're I'm taking some that. body blows in this discussion. I know you better get I, it. Without being able to move. Okay, so... When you drop the ball in, when you drop the ball out, when you drop the ball forward, when you, the subtle things of opening your shoulder and closing them, uh, there's a lot of deception going on in the serves by some players, not all. And there are, there is, there, it's not just two guys out there slugging the ball. There's a lot of baiting going on, making a court look open when it's not open. All right, let me mention this. We talked about my first quadrant in the modern game. Right. It would be the service zone, the whole service zone. I would learn 20 serves of all varieties at all paces and all fakes. From three different areas or four? And or? everywhere that whole thing is a resource to be mined. Right. And it's not being mined. But, but my players do. Well, there may be a few superstars, but I'm talking about... No, they're about... not superstars. No, no, no. Okay. I'm talking every level. Uh, I'm t I'll talk my seven-year-old juniors. I'll throw it out here. I'm teaching them one is a drive serve. If, if they need... And, and there's another thing about coaching. These coaches with the hand signals. A pet peeve of mine is a coach calling serves. And it's gotten to the point where even pros, people are calling serves. To me, that's... Hey, ridiculous. wait a second. You're way behind the eight ball. In the old days, Jay Jones, who we talked about earlier, yeah, the, yeah. Stunt, the stunt double for, for Captain Kirk, his girlfriend The was, guy that wore the earpiece on the court. He wore an earpiece, and Don Noguchi, his girlfriend, would tell him which side the player was... We, we finally made that illegal because we thought she was the real Tokyo Rose. <laughs> but I'll tell you one thing. He could serve the ball, and he had every trick that he could figure out. He treated, you know how people can treat putting as an end-all in itself? Right. And that's what they work on, and they're known for it. They're the boss of the moss or whatever. He treated serve like that. You know how many other pros that I have seen with a bucket of balls down on the court marking the, the thing with tape and coming up with every single idea they can on the serve? That would be zero. Okay, my athletes do that. They do mark the court. But this is where my athletes, I believe, can do better, is the, the creativity part. Creating. I used to make my juniors come up with a, a new serve. I made them sit down in the old days with a sheet of paper and come up with new serves. And I was one boy I had, was like 14, I was playing him. He hit a drive serve right at me, completely shocked me, right down the middle of the court. I mean, he came up with that. Nobody does things like that today. And that, that is true. And Jerry Halasher, who you and I have talked about many times with serves, Jerry played in the Nationals this year, and man, I was right on his first match. And the first serve, <laughs> he walks out three steps, drives serves behind him, wins the rally. Walks out three steps, drives serves to the right, wins the rally. Walks out five steps, hits a drive serve behind him, wins the rally. The next serve, he goes 
doesn't move at all and hits the serve behind him, wins the rally. And okay. that is creativity. It's creativity, and you talk about the timing of delivery. The, the precept, take your time on your serve, is not accurate. What you need to do is you need to have your serve mastered so that you can deliver it on your time schedule and whatever irritates your opponent, short of being un, you know, outlaw, outlawed by the rules, you need to have in your quiver. You need to be able to jack with your opponent. It's the only time you're going to have the ball in your hand. There is so little emphasis on serving in the game that it's, it's, wow. it's amazing to me that, you know how they say half your practice in golf should be on the greens because it's half the game? I don't know what your approximation is of the value of the serve, but it's, it's huge. It's huge, and that amount of time is not being spent in general by instructors or students. And in I general, don't know why. After this tape, it will be. Okay. But, but it, it, my athletes, I'm telling them right off the bat if you don't get screwed by the referee when you hit an ace, you're not hitting good serves because you're going to lose some aces. Mm. That's the object, just over the line. Michelle Gould, Hall of Famer, great, great player, said this to me once about archery, about hitting an arrow in a spot like this at 50 yards. If you can do that, why can't you hit in a, a ball just over the short line? And that anybody in their 20s, all the young players, the the what you said is true. They haven't had, and, and you see it when you're coaching, they're playing the competition at their club. They're not playing for the tournament they're going to have to play at. They're not playing for the Nationals. When you play the Nationals, you work this far on your serves. You also work, and I go back to my seven-year-old, the signals I give them, if they need help, they're told to look back. One was a drive serve, but I'll go one, meaning serve from over here, or one, serve from the middle or over here. It, it's amazing how many close matches you win by just moving the same serve over. Let me make a generic comment, and that is from what I've seen of the modern players, particularly in the elite double A and A categories, everybody serves the ball off the back wall. It's a mortal sin. Any legitimate racquetball player, when presented with a ball off the back wall, should win the serve return outright right then. Right. And I would hazard to guess that 90% of all the serves I've watched in walking by and studying games and what have you, 90% of them are coming off. And this is for from A and no, I know. higher players. I agree. So what I do when I start out a beginner is I have them hit kill shots. I want them to serve kill shots and come up from the bottom as, until, opposed, to coming as down. opposed to coming down from the top. Right. Because I would much rather have my student in a two-serve function, right. serve a short, right. than I would have them serve a ball off the back wall. I'd rather have the second serve be a safe serve then face the ball off the back wall, which is a side out. Now, what right. Jay Jones would do, he was trying to keep the guy off of him. He didn't want to serve it to their forehand, but he wanted them to think that he would serve to the forehand, so he would serve intentional shorts to the forehand side and go, oh, shit, I wish that would have gone in. But really, what he was doing was setting up his serve to the left. Now, the other thing that I will say is when I ask kids or even experienced players, well, what were you aiming for when you served that serve? And they said, well, I was serving a drive to the left. That is unacceptable. There has to be a finite spot when you hit from point A to point B at a particular height, at a particular speed, at a particular angle that will result in the ball hitting one inch over the line, not serving to the left. So you use the spot on the wall? Or? You have to. How else can you get the ball? You can, well, here I can tell you how else. Okay. If you me. use an angle with your body. Your body doesn't change. For example, if you strike a drive serve shin high and you follow through to your knee, 
you're going to get a serve just over the line. I will bet you that if we take two students and we have one of them start trying to kill the ball and the other student going whatever protocol the <laughs> pros are being taught these days and then after they can kill the ball repeatedly off the serve, I put a piece of tape over there and any other method is used and we take a hundred well, serves. So I, let me no, finish okay. because this is going to be a clapping. The people <laughs> that can hit all tape are going to be demonstrably superior to anyone using any other method. Now I also want to tell you this, that the concept of looking at a spot that you're aiming is not alien. You're in the military. Would you teach someone to just sight their gun along their arm and that would be sufficient? No. You'd be looking at the bullseye. If you're playing darts, if you're playing golf and you want to go in that hole, do you look at that hole or do you just go, I'm going to hit it toward that green area at the end of the... No, 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 no wait a minute. Okay. Your body doesn't change. If you strike the ball in this area, well, first of all, beginners, I don't think I would be this sophisticated with beginners, but intermediate level players, I don't like aiming for spots on the wall for a number of reasons. One, I shouldn't be looking at the wall. I should be looking at the ball when I hit it, not the wall. Well, the point is you pick out the spot in your mind's eye. You take a picture in your mind. So this is it's, where your rifle analogy doesn't work, because when you sight a well, rifle... Well, it's different than a rifle in one sense. When you, it's like putting. Most putters do not look at the hole. Some do when they have the yips. But what they do is they take a mental picture of this path and then while it is fresh in their mind, the moving picture of where that putt's going to go, they then watch the ball. That is what and they, I think. And they're looking down like this at the ball. They're not looking to where it's going to go. Correct. Now, one of the things that you'll find, let's talk about striking the ball. That sounded like you agreed with me. I do agree with almost all that you say that I don't disagree with. <laughs> Now, what, I, what I've been experimenting with recently is taking a picture of the spot. Now, this is, a, this is fascinating. You started this in Fullerton. Sorry to interrupt you. This is good stuff. Go ahead. You take a picture of the spot you're hitting to, for instance, off the back wall. So rather than going back and be fixated on the ball, uh -huh. Have enough experience to where you know, unless it's approaching a crack where you have to give it special vigilance, you know basically where that ball's coming out. So as you're positioning, you spot with mental acuity and physical acuity the spot that you want to hit to, and then you turn your attention to the ball. And you keep in your mind's eye that spot. I have seen great players do that. I have never done it. In fact, I didn't watch the ball during the swing, which is a very grave fault. Think about what you just said. All right. Go back to the matches, the legendary matches. The one that you talked about, Paul Lawrence. Got beat 21-3. to three. Came back. I don't know how I did it. If you stop and think about it, that is, that's the process you did when you were faced with adversity, you're faced with the will to win. Isn't that what you do? You will the ball down? I will the ball in, but you can only do that in times of crisis. Well, why Tiger couldn't, Woods why can couldn't do it you in train? Times of, why can't you train yourself so you can do it more often? Because God doesn't allow you to will the ball <laughs> in every time. You also have to have a system for those non-emergency modes. In the cr absolute crush, I will the ball in. Kane wills the ball in. Hogan wills the ball in. Hogan hit a ball. I mean, I've seen it a bunch of times with athletes. Tiger Woods wills the ball in the hole. Kobe Bryant wills the ball in the hole. It, it happens, but it's never something you do each time. You'd burn right. out the resource. So what I'm trying to figure out is what is the most effective way on a time-by-time -time basis to make that ball hit bottom board in the right corner with an off-the-back wall forehand. And I believe that if someone experimented with a spot look right before turning the tension to the ball, that if we did a thousand shots and charted it, 
Okay, once you got used to that, being able to get the mental and physical acuity to go back from there to the ball, once you develop that, you would have much more accuracy. And I know on the serve that if I tested any student or any pro and they took a picture of that tape spot and went to the ball and hit, that their pattern of ball striking on that spot is going to be better than someone who doesn't do that technique. Now, so then the only question remaining is, do you somehow give away what you're going to do by looking at a spot? Is there ways around that? Do you, can you figure out what spot to hit that makes the ball go one inch over the line? Well, I think that's obviously attainable. So to me, someone who does not practice, half of their practice, hitting spots on serve is reducing their chances to be successful. I'll put it that bluntly.